What's up, everybody? Hello and welcome into another live show. I am John Kurtz. We can talk some basketball tonight. We've got the brackets out there getting through Selection Sunday here today. Not the greatest of tournament draws for the Big 12. I think uh, a little a little bit of disrespect for the league, probably buying too much into the dumb narrative started by coaches in the ACC about the Big 12 and the Nets. But I digress. Uh, we also, of course, have a lot to talk about with the college football playoff. And that is going to be, I would imagine, the majority of the show tonight because the Big 12 and the ACC did give in. We've been talking and speculating about this for a long time. Would the Big 12 and the ACC give in? We got to what was supposed to be the deadline uh, by the end of this week, and we are here, and uh, the Big 12 and the ACC have said okay. Uh, that is the reporting from Ross Dellinger and all corners of the college football world that they are in on the revenue-sharing model for the college football playoff, and they are in on whatever the format is going to turn out to be, which we don't have yet. But we do have a lot of details about all of this. Frankly, fairly disappointing uh, if you are the Big 12 in terms of what the dollar structure is compared to the ACC. It was actually even a little bit wider of a gap between the Big 12 and the ACC. But that brings me to the title of this video, and that is simply, we've talked a lot about the Big 12 and the perspective of the league and whether or not you would want the Big 12 to go ahead and sign on to this thing. And so many people here on this channel, we went through the other day, I'm trying to remember what day that was, how, maybe the live show last Sunday, where everybody just, to a man, everybody in this chat, it was like, bam, 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 bam. Everybody said like, nah, just tell them to kick rocks, do their own thing, start their own playoff, and don't worry about this. That was like the Big 12 general attitude. And I know it does sound like behind the scenes, Jim Phillips, definitely put up a bit of a stink about how the revenue sharing was going with this whole deal. But I'm surprised that he wound up just giving in by the deadline on this thing, because if you are the ACC, I, I, I fail to see how signing off on this thing, when you've already got Florida state as mad as they are uh, Clemson, North Carolina lurking and waiting and trying to get away. If you sign off on this thing, you just took another massive financial step back from everybody else officially not that it maybe would have made a ton of difference if you had fought for the same amount of money, but it, it could have made some difference. And uh, I'm just a, a bit surprised without knowing the dynamics of what all was said or threatened or done behind the scenes. I am a bit surprised that Jim Phillips did wind up giving in like this without making it more of a messy and murky situation. But that's where we stand uh, with the college football playoff on track to be a 12 or 14 team playoff and to, uh, have the Big 12 and the ACC making a combined $300 million less per year, plus uh, than the SEC and the Big 10. But there are a lot of details, a lot of details that we got out of the reporting on this that are a bit different from what we had anticipated before. So that's basically what I've got. If you want to talk NCAA tournament, you want to talk about Oklahoma being the first team left out of the field, you want to talk about Iowa State getting kind of screwed with their draw being just the number eight overall seed by the committee, not even in the conversation for a one seed getting stuck with South Dakota state and then potentially Drake and then being in the same bracket as UConn, uh, the number one overall seed. Um, there's a lot that we can talk about a lot that we can talk about here today. You guys know, if you've been here before, you can be a part of the show. You will lead us in whatever direction you want to go in tonight. And you can do so by clicking the dollar sign below the chat box that will allow you to attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat, puts it in a separate column for me and uh, ensures that you will make it on the show here tonight. So it is a way for you to make your voice heard, to control the content on the show tonight, and support the work that I'm doing to bring you conference realignment, college football, college basketball content on a week-in, week-out basis. Could not do it without your guys' support, and uh, I much appreciate all of you guys who do so generously uh, contribute to the channel. An easy way to contribute as well for free, just one click. If you could please like the video, that would be great. One click, like the video, all that really helps as well. And make sure you leave a comment underneath the video here, regardless of whether you're in here live or not. If you can type a comment down into the comment box below the video, let me know what you think about uh, the ACC deciding to give in here to the SEC and the Big Ten with the new college football playoff. Also, if you are catching up after the fact, you're not seeing this live, you can contribute to the channel on Venmo, john kurtz 4 in order to do that. And if you do that and leave a question or comment there, I will read it on the next show. In fact, I need to double check. Can't remember if I had one or 
not. I'm just going to scan that real quick. I know I had a couple on the last live show that I did. Looks like March 9th. So, okay. Yeah, I think I got to that one. That was Eric. Yeah, that was Eric. Okay. So, John Dash Curse Dash 4 on Venmo if you want to go that way. Uh, all right. Let's talk playoff. This is the Ross Dellinger article. I'm going to uh, read you from what he had to say. He's been on top of all of this. He had the first report, at least the first extensive report about the Big 12 and the ACC basically agreeing to this. And that was like in the middle of the week. So, you know, that's a part of this is that we knew about Wednesday that the Big 12 and the ACC had basically signed off on this, that the presidents gave everybody else in charge permission to go ahead and sign off on the new playoff revenue distribution format so it didn't drag out until the end of the week it didn't drag out until friday it didn't drag out until the last possible minute with the big 12 and the acc which were considered to be the two hurdles understandably so because they were about to take big steps back from where they have been uh in their pecking order in this world beforehand they didn't take it down to the last second uh but here was the story that came out on friday when everything was officially um Agreed to, at least in principle, memorandum of understanding is the wording that they've used here in terms of what exactly has been reached. But Dellinger says college leaders have struck a deal on a new college football playoff contract. Executives from the 10 FBS conferences and Notre Dame agreed Friday to a new contract with ESPN that will begin in 2026, coming to terms on a revenue distribution model and protections related to the future playoff format. The news was expected after Big 12 and ACC presidents voted Wednesday to authorize their commissioners to adopt the new framework. The two conferences were viewed as most reluctant to agree to a framework that puts them at a financial disadvantage. Conference commissioners and leaders from Notre Dame signed memorandums of understanding on the concepts previously reported by Yahoo Sports as it relates to revenue and format, as well as the new deal with ESPN. So they have signed, they have signed on to agree to the revenue distribution, which we're going to get to the specifics of that, but the revenue distribution that would put the SEC and Big Ten ahead of everybody, it will give everybody more money than what they were making this last go around, but the SEC and Big Ten are going to nearly quadruple each school what they are getting in terms of a payout, where the Big 12 and the ACC will still more than double, but it's not quadrupling. It's not quite what the SEC and Big Ten are doing here. So they are increasing their gap while everybody does make more money in total. That's what we have out of all of this. Um, and Notre Dame, by the way, if you are curious, their base, their base will be very much in line with what the Big 12 gets, virtually the same thing. But if they make the playoff, then they get an extra sum of money on top of that. And they are the only team that can make an extra bit of money. They're the only team that is incentivized that way, which was an interesting wrinkle uh, about all of this. But as I mentioned, Dellinger points out Big 12 and ACC presidents voted Wednesday to authorize their commissioners to adopt a new framework. That was the timeline for the Big 12 and the ACC coming along and finally doing this. And we did learn later on in the article as well that it was a six week battle on this. Uh, they had been kind of duking out the revenue sharing stuff for about six weeks. So it was no short battle here. I should give Jim Phillips credit for that, at least based on what we know from the reporting. It's not like he just lied down very early on. Uh, but still, he didn't make them sweat as much as they possibly could have there. Uh, the new television contract with ESPN is a six-year extension through the 2031 playoff. It will pay the college football playoff $1.3 billion annually, about three times the amount the network distributed for the four-team version. Those figures were reported by ESPN itself in a story in January. Nothing has changed with what the ESPN deal is being reported to be. That is what we have known for quite some time now. If you add all that up, it gets to like what is like close to eight billion dollars, uh, but one point three billion per year will be the payout there. Uh, a new playoff format is not expected to be finalized until a later date, though protections and guarantees related to a twelve or fourteen playoff, twelve or fourteen team playoff uh, are a part of the agreement. Protections and guarantees there being like, hey, if it's going to be a 12-team playoff like Notre Dame, if you're in the top 12, you'll make it in. If it's going to be a 14-team playoff, Notre Dame, if you are in the top 14, you will be in. 
the Big 12, the ACC, any of the conferences, Power Four conferences, your conference champion will be in in either format. Those types of things uh, are the guarantees related to the format. The champions of the four major conferences and the highest ranked group of five champion will earn an automatic qualifying spot into any playoff. Okay, there you go. I jumped the gun by one line. Uh, Notre Dame is expected to have its own protections related to a format. The Irish can earn a guaranteed at-large spot based on their college football playoff ranking. Uh, That guarantee is contingent, however, on the number of automatic qualifiers in a finalized format. So again, it would be different whether it was 12 or 14. If you're in the top 14, Notre Dame's automatically going to be in there. If they are in the top 12, they are automatically going to be in there. Uh, How to distribute the money was an intense and at times contentious process among conference commissioners, a debate that started in earnest about six weeks ago. You can imagine that this was pretty contentious, specifically with, and I, I would be very curious to know how the dynamics worked out behind the scenes between Brett Yormark and Jim Phillips and how they were kind of arguing this from each of their sides. Obviously, neither one is going to be happy or thrilled with the the setup that they fall behind the SEC and Big Ten the way that they do with this, but it, it feels much more like the ACC has its literal life on the line with this, whereas the Big 12 can kind of sit and say, like, hey, Brett Yormark seemingly picked his spot of saying, hey, why don't we just throw in a clause that in 2028 we can look in on this thing and change it up based on who's been making the playoff and any conference realignment, which that's actually another trigger in there. If there is realignment, they can revisit it before 2028. So he kind of threw that in like, hey, let's just make sure that we can change any of this. If we need to change it, um, we'll be good to go with that. Meanwhile, Jim Phillips is probably sitting there like, dude, like anything I sign, like this is just the word we're signing away our conference because it's going to make Florida State even more mad, which is going to lead to them hastening the process of getting out of this joint, which is going to lead to other people leaving. And uh, there's there's the end of our conference. Um, So I plus your mark. Your mark just always seems so measured. He seems very, very measured. Um, you'd never see too much of a, a an emotional high or emotional low from him at all when he's presenting himself in public. So because of that, I very much wonder aloud what he is like to negotiate with behind the scenes. I, I can't claim to have seen a ton of Jim Phillips to have put together a great opinion of that. But all I know is that during that last round of playoff negotiations, Jim Phillips was the one that continuously felt like was putting it really at risk and it, 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 putting things in jeopardy for leagues like the Big 12 and the ACC. Uh, so I always kind of took him to be somebody with uh, perhaps a less measured approach than what Brett Yormark has. Okay. The Big 10 and SEC will combine to earn about 58% of the college football playoffs base distribution, 29% each. The figure would greatly exceed the ACC and Big 12's combined distribution number, which is expected to be around 32%. The ACC will get 17.1%, while the Big 12 receives 14.7%. So that is a 2.4% difference there. The ACC schools will get 2.4% more than the Big 12. Uh, The remaining amount will be distributed to Notre Dame and the 64 group of five teams. Let me pull down. I've got another list here where I can just read it out to you. Okay. Here is here is the revenue model if you just want it like bang, bang, bang down the line. The SEC will get 29%. The Big Ten will get 29%. The ACC will get 17.1%. The Big 12 will get 14.7%. Notre Dame will get 1%. Uh, UConn, Oregon State, Washington State, other independents get less than 1%. That is the breakdown of the college football playoff distribution now um so the big 12 getting 14.1 percent versus the acc getting 17.1 i know some people will question that like why are we doing that i saw it i think on twitter right before i hopped on here as i was going back and looking through some of these articles some of the responses i saw like why is the acc getting more um i'm not saying it's right or that you have to agree with it but it is it is based on the history in the playoff, they went through and said, all right, last however many years, the SEC got this number of teams in, they should get this percentage. It's basically what it was. So the logic there being the ACC has had seven teams as their conference is currently put together right now. They have seven teams that have made the college football playoff before. So the Big 12 only has two being TCU 
and Cincinnati. Only two appearances there. So thus, the difference. Not a drastic difference, but it is at least substantial. And that felt a touch higher, I believe, than the other number I had seen before. So I know some people will take that as like, hey, a little bit of a Big 12 slight there, but I... I don't really think it ultimately matters much because it seems very clear where the ACC is headed, and that is to destruction. So eventually, it's just not going to matter that much. Now, would it be nice still to have a little bit more money in the interim? Yes, especially because it does seem like I've heard behind the scenes that there there may be a bit of a shortfall for some of these schools based on the last TV contract and what Brett Yormark had promised and what is actually going to be delivered. Uh, so there, there may be schools here in the big 12 that are like man, having an extra 2% there would really help us fill in some gaps. I think there's going to be a bit of an issue there from what schools had budgeted for, uh, maybe nothing like crazy major, but at least something, um, we'll see where that goes, but that is, that is something that was relayed to me. Um, the difference in distribution between the two sets of conferences, the sec, big 10 and ACC, big 12 could exceed 300 million. The Power Two stand to earn a combined figure that should eclipse 700 million, far more than the ACC and Big 12's number of around 400 million. Roughly 115 million is slotted for the group of five. So one of the interesting parts of this is that, yeah, I mean, not only am I telling you that it, it really feels like the ACC has agreed to just sign its death warrant, but you do now have an official admission maybe not admission, but like an official acquiescing of the Big 12 and the ACC here publicly to the SEC and the Big 10 just being like, yeah, we are lesser than. This is you signing on the dotted line saying we are lesser than. And uh, at least if we're just taking the popular vote around here and what things looked like around here last Sunday when I was talking to all of you guys, you guys seemed very much of the mind that the Big 12 and the ACC should not do this. Well, they have. So that's now a reality everybody is going to have to live with moving forward. Like everybody has said, hey, the Big 10 and the SEC are worth more than you. TV has, clearly with the TV contracts, uh, many fans have. Anybody generally looking at the sport right now has been saying, yeah, these are the leagues that run stuff. But it never been really like publicly acknowledged by the Big 12 or the ACC for obvious reasons until right now. That has definitely happened. And you've you've set a precedent right now if you are the Big 12 or the ACC that we are not what the Big 10 and the SEC are. So it is what it is. I'm not saying that they really had a ton of other choices or options, although many of you guys seem to think that they did and should have opted not to do this. And I, I definitely understand that. And I got more of a mind to be that way as you were faced with this reality and what it was actually going to look like moving forward. But it is very hard to be staring all that money in the face and the extra money that, you know, doubling more than doubling your college football playoff uh, income and, and saying, Hey, we're, we're going to turn that down actually right now. That's hard to do. And, and actually having access to a new playoff, like that's hard to do when you kind of know you don't have a ton of leverage. So in the end, I don't know how much of a fight was really put up, and maybe we will never know how much of a fight was really put up behind the scenes. But here we sit, and and that is a fact that has now come out of this. You have now publicly admitted that you are not what the Big Ten and the SEC are, and that is definitely going to uh, to carry some level of consequence moving forward. Um, I think everybody understood we were headed there, but it is it is definitely, definitely now there. If you want to be a part of the show tonight, click the dollar sign below the chat box to uh, attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat, puts it in a separate column for me. Guarantees that you will get on the show here tonight. Let your voice be heard. You can control where we're going on the show, dictate some of the content tonight, and it is a way to support the work that I'm doing on this channel, bringing you college football, conference realignment, college basketball content on a week-in, week-out basis. Houston Cougars, Germany. What's up, Houston Cougars, Germany? Always love to have you here. Thank you for checking in. Congrats to uh, your Cougs for getting a number one seed in the NCAA tournament, even after really taking it on the chin in that Big 12 championship game, man. That was crazy. Iowa State damn near winning by 30, man. A 28-point victory to uh, wrap up the Big 12 conference tournament title, but uh, still pretty nice landing spot for uh, for Houston, the number one seed in the South region. So, uh, boy. My German, I, I I don't have German skills here. Doc Sean, I don't know. 
someone someone's gonna clip that and make fun of me uh johan great job uh go cougs go cougs thank you houston cougars germany uh we'll be rooting for houston in the tournament for sure david what's up david thank you for being here david david says notre dame getting the same as smu bc and ucf is hilarious it is kind of funny now notre dame does have a bit more of an incentive in fact i can jump ahead just a little bit here since you brought it up david in the article says Notre Dame, one of the sport's historical powers that retains its seat in the college football playoff governance structure, will see its distribution double to $12.5 million annually, with a caveat that includes a financial bonus. The four independents are eligible for a performance distribution payout, which means if Notre Dame or other independents qualify for the playoff, they each receive a flat fee of $6 million. So any year that if I'm going to assume that we're going to 14, right? Any year that Notre Dame finishes in the top 14 of the playoff, they will actually be making more uh, than the schools you just mentioned, because then they would get the extra $6 million and make 18.5. Nobody else has a performance um, deal there. What are they calling it here? Performance distribution payout. Nobody else has that anymore. That was one of the concerns. And it looks like a concession that was made by the SEC and the big 10 of like, fine, we won't base any of the revenue payout based on how many teams get in and how many games you win. There's not going to be that sort of payout except for Notre Dame. You make it in. Here you go. Here's some extra cash. Um, so that, that seems like a bit of a concession by the big 10 and the sec on a couple of accounts, one to make Notre Dame happy two to appease the big 12 and the ACC. And so it looks like maybe that fight, the big 12 and ACC's fight, whatever it was, did at least lead to that, which would keep, the SEC and Big Ten from escalating it even more uh, with those performance bonuses where they had kind of rigged the system for that. So, yes, that is the deal. Twelve point five million. Uh, yeah, twelve point five million for uh, Notre Dame uh, is what they will get. Uh, I was trying to see what the if I had the specific payout numbers per conference here i know that i've got them somewhere per team per conference um yeah i will find it i will find it for you at some point here on the show but it's a it's a valid point david i would just also point out that if they're going to make the top 14 which I, i'd have to go back and look like how many years out of the last like 10 15 20 years notre dame has been in the top 14 they've been in the top 14 pretty frequently so i i do think there will be a lot of years where they're going to make more um, but on the surface, yes, we can poke fun there. They're not getting the Big Ten or SEC uh, level payout, not quite uh, on that front. And they will they will have to earn it. Like, it's going to be out there for Notre Dame. You guys definitely have to earn it, whereas the SEC and the Big Ten uh, will not have to earn it to that extent. What's up, Alan? Uh, appreciate you being here, Alan. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Alan says, John, any idea what Brett Yormark's rationale might be? Uh, he surely has a plan. We should invite him to join your show to explain. Uh, hoping Bill Self is right and the Jayhawks are ready to make a run. Rock Chalk Jayhawk Allen. Yeah, I mean, I think your mark just the thing with your mark going back to this last round of realignment when he outfoxed the Pac-12 was that he had a much better understanding of like what he 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 had a much yeah just much better understanding of what his league was. Uh, self-awareness. He had better self-awareness than George Klievkov and the Pac-12 did because Klievkov and the Pac-12 tried to fight this battle of, hey, we should be making as much as the Big Ten. Like, we are on that level. That's what we should be getting, not, hey, we need to survive. We need to make sure that we survive and we need to be better than the Big 12. They thought too highly of themselves and that did not work out very well for them. Brett Yormark realized, hey, the battle here is to be third place. The, the battle is for third. First and second has been won. Um, we need to maximize what we are and try and be the place for everybody else, the best of the rest, and maximize basketball and use other advantages that we have here um, if we want to get to where we want to go. And that's how he won. That's how he outdueled George Klievkov in the Pac-12. So it, I feel like in this case, it is a little bit more like he's looking at it like, man, We've already got an advantage over the ACC. We're not going to be the Big Ten of the SEC. We've already got an advantage over the ACC. If the ACC signs this thing, Florida State is definitely out. Not like they were not going to be out anyway, but they're for sure even further out the door. 
which is going to lead to other teams coming out. And it's going to lead to the implosion of that conference. They're going to be gone. We'll scoop up some of the leftovers. And that's why I'm throwing in this provision here where we can just go ahead and look in and tweak this a bit and things will work out okay for us anyway. Um, so I think a lot of it is just about the self-awareness that your Mark has always had throughout this entire process and him just being more willing probably to accept that. And like I said, this deal signing this deal is worse for the ACC than it is for the big 12, even though they are picking up technically more money in the short term than the big 12 is a higher chunk of the percentage of the pie. What really matters is that it's, it's for them, another big signal that, Hey, we're, we're stepping even further back to these brands because they have those bigger brands than anything that's left in the big 12 um, that screws with the dynamics of their conference. So that, that I would imagine has to be most of, of Brett Yormark's thinking. Now, I still understand why a lot of people would be like, look, you still, we still shouldn't be officially signing away something, you know, like screw them, tell them to kick rocks and do their own thing or make us equals. Um, I, I get where that attitude comes from. I just think Yormark is still busy trying to maximize everything he's got and has a better understanding of his place in all of this. We'll see about Bill Self, man. I, the thing with saying they're ready to make a run and like, we'll be okay. So much of that is just contingent on the health, obviously, of McCuller and Dickinson. And, and especially with McCuller, the way that's gone on for so long, I would have concerns there. He had to say the right things about them being healthy just for the the sake of their tournament seating, because otherwise the committee will ding you. So it, it incentivizes lying about the, the health there, painting a rosier picture about the health there. So, you know, he did what anybody would do. I'm certainly a little bit skeptical as to the full on validity of that, but maybe he is right. And I will say this, I think Kansas's draw is set up for kind of a feast or famine sort of thing. I think their first round game against Sanford is very tough because that's one of the best three point shooting teams in the country. Uh, they do a lot of things that in particular, just shoot the three ball that are really, it can lead to upsets in March and are things that Kansas has struggled with. So I think that's a really tough first round matchup. But if you get past that, I mean, Gonzaga as your five, that's pretty manageable. And then you're in the region where Purdue is the one seed. We know what Purdue has typically done in March, and that is just completely fold up. So whether you would run into them or they would stub their toe before then, which they've obviously been apt to do, that could open up quite a bit for Kansas. So that that would be how I would view it if I were a Kansas fan like this. This actually could be pretty good for us uh, in terms of how the draw goes, as long as you're able to get past that first round game, which you know, probably will be contingent uh, very largely so on on the health of McCuller and, and Dickinson. So that's kind of how I see the uh, the Kansas draw and where the Jayhawks are at, Allen. But hope you enjoyed the tournament, my friend. Hope you had a great selection Sunday, and thank you for being here on the channel. Oh, as far as getting your mark on, I did uh, when we went down, when I was at Big 12 Football Media Day, this past year, I was like on his list. I got put on the list of interviews for him, but I don't think he got to nearly everybody. And I was not able to uh, to track him down before. Unfortunately, the day was over. So instead, we got that rather explosive interview with uh, Big 12 Deputy Commissioner Tim Weiser. Uh, that sufficed. And that was pretty good content. So I have tried before. He's not an easy guy uh, to track down, but I can try to put in a request again and, and see. Uh, see what happens there he's just not a guy who does a ton of one-on-one -on -one interviews uh like that and with big 12 football media days being in vegas this year unless somebody wants to uh foot the travel bill to get me out there to vegas i uh i don't know that that is going to happen unfortunately uh wish wish i could wish i could do that but a little bit easier when you can i mean dallas is like that's that's driving distance for me so anyway appreciate you Alan. thank you for being here uh john teal what's up john teal john teal says big 12 was smart to get a deal uh from the pack grave so yeah sending that from the pack 12's grave hey the big 12 was smart to get a deal survive yeah kind of goes along with what i was saying a second ago about your mark and self-awareness and just being like hey we got to do this take what we can get because we are what we are and we're still in a pretty good position here to be the number three when all the dust settles and then we can start working really hard on basketball and maximizing that as much as we can. And maybe that'll at least somewhat close the gap. And, you know, that's sort of your, your long-term plan and your long-term outlook here, as opposed to, Hey, we'll call their bluff, tell them to kick rocks. And then if they do, 
we all of a sudden have just started life as a completely different entity instead of a different entity we're just a completely different deal instead of just being a lesser citizen in like power four football we are now not even in power four football it's power two and then what we're doing is like an f uh, you know souped up fcs you know that's kind of what they were staring in the face there so uh can understand where you're coming from john teal uh michael what's up michael uh michael says honest question uh does the big 12 uh feel tech is little bro as a new member i've had mostly bad experiences with the players fans and school uh feels like utah state hashtag byu Ooh, okay so texas tech we're talking about texas tech here i thought when I first read that, I saw tech and bro, and I thought it was going to be an analogy of, of the Big 12 being a tech bro. And I was like, okay, I'm here for this. Like, let's let's go. I'm very interested in where this is going. Uh, BYU lost in the Big 12 tournament to Texas Tech. I'd imagine that's where some of the bad blood is stemming from here. I would just spin it like this. I would say that Texas Tech fans who, look, I've I feel like I've rode pretty hard with Texas tech for a long time here because I appreciate their passion. They are an incredibly passionate fan base, pretty big fan base and a fan base that does have a lot of money. Like tech does not lack for money, certainly relative to, uh, to the teams left in the big 12. Now that Texas and Oklahoma are gone, they have a lot of things going for them. And I, I very much respect all that. Having said that they are really passionate. And because of that, like they will fight. They are feisty. They are very, very feisty. Tech fans are definitely feisty, loud, and there's a lot of them. So uh, that I think is a reality of tech. I mean, I think K State certainly. I'm not sitting here trying to throw stones, and I'm not really even knocking that. That's what Texas Tech is. I mean, K State fans have that attitude of like chip on their shoulder, feisty because of the circumstances of the school being a smaller ag school and one that. Uh, could very easily be left behind in the event of some major conference realignment shift just because of geographics and where they're at, but constantly punches above its weight class in terms of achievement actually on the field. You get a lot of feistiness there out of the fan base. So uh, I've actually always said, like, I feel like Tech and K-State are pretty similar in that regard. So that's what I would say about Texas Tech. Uh, you do definitely have to respect Texas Tech's basketball program. They they are one of the what it's three uh three that have been to a national championship game in the last is that five years ago tech fans was that 18 19 i think that was 18 19 so maybe that would be six years ago anyway in the last half decade or just over that uh playing in a national championship game so uh, you do have to give a lot of respect to uh to the hoops program there now football has not had a double digit win season since uh since the days of good old uh mike leach rest in peace roaming around there but uh tech has a very loud vocal and into it fan base um i don't know anything about utah state the only i i know that uh jordan love played at utah state and i know that matt wells who's now k-state's quarterbacks coach uh i know that he was once the head coach at utah state that's about all i've got so that'd be my assessment for you michael i hope that uh hope that suffices uh appreciate you as always though what's up daniel daniel uh daniel says maryland making more than acc and big 12 schools that's funny yeah i mean it is what it is i don't know if, if uh, daniel i can't tell if you are a maryland fan or if you are just somebody pointing out like kind of the opposite side like taking a bit of a shot there being like really like freaking maryland is making that much i went on a big rant the other day on our it, that was the three mob podcast i think it was around the time k-state was playing in the pop tarts bowl where I was like, dude, Maryland football is the most like milk toast. Like, I just, I, I don't care. Like, what you know, boring football program. And we had a big argument about it because you know Mike Loxley obviously is a guy who can coach some offense. And I know that Talia was there, and they did have more of a high flying offense. I just Maryland football has always seemed rather obscure to me. Um, so if you are not a Maryland fan, you're not going to get much of an argument from me in that. That, that does seem kind of funny that that's how that's going. If you are a Maryland fan, then you probably hate me for everything that I've just said. Um, but even like Maryland basketball, I just don't, I don't feel like I hear much from Maryland anymore. And I remember growing up like Ralph Friesian and Gary Williams and Juan Dixon, you know, like I just felt like I was hearing from Maryland a lot more than I, than I do these days, but that's the reality. You have all the, 
schools that won the birth lottery just by happening to be in areas that worked out for where they're at in their conferences in Maryland, obviously that's because of being close to the DC market and getting that bump up to the big 10 when they did, you know, they certainly are not more accomplished than schools that we just talked about in the big 12, uh, for instance, around here, but yet by virtue of winning the birth lottery, they get to be locked into much more security in terms of their future at the, uh, the big boy table in college athletics. But it is what it is. It is what it is. Papa Bravo. What's up, Papa Bravo? Uh, Papa Bravo says, hey, John, feel free to get snarky. How do you feel about Oklahoma's big dance snub? Uh, hashtag later Sooners. Well, I'm certainly not brokenhearted for them, especially as a, a K-State fan where my team was at least sort of on the bubble and did not make it in. I'm not going to shed a tear for Porter Mosier and company. Um and and honestly, like they they beat two tournament teams. They beat two teams that are in the entire field, or at least that were projected in the entire field. Maybe there was like a third one that snuck in there or something. I know at least as of the week leading up to the tournament, in Lenardi's projected field, they had beaten two tournament teams the entire way there. I know that some injuries played a factor in that, but again, I'm not shedding any tears because K-State played the entire season without Naquan Tomlin and Quez Glover their best player, and then a guy who is probably going to be a starter. So no tears shed on that front for me. I, I Oklahoma left the door wide open for something like this to happen to them, and the committee, I think, very much bought into this stupid narrative that the Big 12 gamed the system with the net, even though Joe Lenardi, Scott Van Pelt, and others have pointed out that that was really pretty farcical and not actually true and not actually what happened. But getting that narrative out there – apparently worked so Porter Mosier should not be sending any Christmas cards to Brad Brownell uh, I can tell you that much because it seemed like that you know committee really really bought hard into that with how they seeded Iowa State with what happened to Oklahoma um, even like Texas Tech I feel like was probably under seeded by uh, a line that's probably like more of a five seed four five sort of team but they get a six um, did not seem to uh, have the respect that some thought that they might for all of that. So I won't get too terribly snarky because honestly, like, I don't know, do Oklahoma fans even care that much about basketball? I mean, I'm sure they're kind of disappointed, but this is not going to be like me trying to get after him for like Lincoln Riley. Um, that's not going to do it because uh, they, they just don't care nearly as much about basketball. I've seen enough games at the Lloyd Noble center to know well how much they actually care about, uh, about hoops. So uh, Oklahoma left the door wide open for that. Th that was one of the teams that I was like, you know, K-State getting left out because I knew that they probably were going to. I was like, you know, Oklahoma being in the field is so stupid relative to, to K-State. And now I don't have to be angry and upset about that because Oklahoma got left out as well. Literally the last team out of the field. So, yeah, it's difficult. Um, be interested to see what, what happens with OU hoops moving forward. I guess now that Porter Mosher is staying, at least he's not going to DePaul. Uh, we know that, but it looks like he is staying. Uh, but much appreciate you, uh, Papa Bravo. And we say hello to Glenn. What's up, Glenn? Uh, Glenn says, it seems that no one gives a rat's button about athletics anymore. It's all about money. It is sad to see where it has gone. I don't think anybody in this chat could argue with that statement at all. It is 100% about money. It is 100% sad. It is blowing up everything that is near and dear to us about these sports and it sucks um dan wolken i know he's a really polarizing guy but he wrote a pretty good column about the state of college athletics this past week and where it's going and what the sec and the big 10 are are doing to it you know via the tv networks obviously to uh really screw things up at this point but yeah toothpaste coming out of the tube you're not going to be able to put it back in and uh, we're really ruining a good thing and even you know, Greg Sankey has been out here along with Brett Yormark campaigning for, hey, we need to expand the tournament a bit because good teams that could actually legitimately make runs are being left out. Pointing out like UCLA's run from the other a couple of years ago to the final four. Well, they're going to, by the way, if you're somebody who doesn't want the tournament to expand, get ready for that conversation to heat up because so many bid stealers happened during conference championship week that you had a lot of power conference teams. Like look at the Big East, for instance. You know, a lot of power conference teams get left out that were certainly, I think, like good enough to at least have a claim to being a tournament team. 
you're going to see much more talk about that. We can't have the Oklahomas of the world, for instance, getting left out. You will hear that from these power conference commissioners in uh, in wanting to get the, the field expanded, for sure. But I agree with you, Glenn. It's sad. I just try to... I just try to operate in uh, in the reality of what we have. Like, I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. So I'm going to just try and enjoy it as much as I can based on what the current system is and uh, go from there. That's kind of where I'm at on the whole thing. Uh, John Teal. John Teal says, how did calling one's bluff go for the Pac-12 versus ESPN? Well, you're definitely right there. You've got to have a good sense for uh, – when to call the bluff and when to not, you know, no when to hold them, no when to fold them. I believe a wise man once said, and George Klievkov had no sense for that. Uh, Brett Yormark clearly did. Brett Yormark said, come on down ESPN and Fox. We'll do the deal. Let's go. Uh, so yeah, fair, fair point there. Back to your original talking point about uh, the big 12 taking the deal and that being a good thing as opposed to what happened to the PAC 12. What's up, Daniel? Appreciate you. Uh, great to see you as always. Cat fan in Huskerland, a.k.a. Daniel Osborne. Uh, Daniel says, I'm a little disappointed by the Big 12 decision to go along with this deal, but it is a lot of money. Uh, congrats on all the Big 12 men's and women's teams that made the NCAA tournament. Go Cats in the NIT and NCAA women's tournaments. Yeah, I haven't seen anything official. At least I didn't before I hopped on here. Maybe that's gone official by this point on the K-State men and the NIT, but I did have someone tell me was likely that they would be playing on wednesday in it a lot of teams are trying to get down there's been like four i believe that already had st john's was the last one i saw that said no i mean like personally i don't know like if tang and them if they want to do it i'm sure the athletic department would like to make a little bit of extra money there if they can host games i just would not be heartbroken if they didn't do it i'll put it that way it's hard. I'm, I'm not going to really care very much about it. I guess if you feel like you can get developmental time, but you're going to have guys entering the portal and you're going to have guys deciding to just move on. I don't know how much of a roster you're going to have. It just, uh, I don't know. I, I couldn't, I couldn't really bring myself to care a whole lot, but yeah, the case state women got a top four seed and they avoided South Carolina's bracket, which I thought was huge uh, to have a better chance of going to the final four. They're in Iowa's bracket and they beat Iowa once this year they split two games with them in fact in the non-con so uh happy to see that for the women and awesome 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 that they get a chance to host uh that that is huge so yes daniel i am with you on that and uh i can understand your disappointment as well i know you were one of those who on the show last week echoed that opinion that many had of like hey just tell the sec and big 10 to kick rocks don't accept the deal um i get being a little disappointed by it but Maybe if you look at the long term here, Brett Yormark seems to be operating on a long term plan here to be third and maybe not as far away as you are right now to at least pull the gap in a little bit closer by leveraging hoops as much as you can. Uh, I guess I, I got to just say, trust the process on that as much as you can with a guy in Brett Yormark who's nailed the big picture stuff so far. A lot of the more like minutia day to day stuff about running things within the conference. I'm not sure that all that has been quite as good, but uh, if he nails the big picture stuff, it it doesn't really matter. Appreciate you, Daniel. Thank you for being here. We've got David. What's up, David? David says, John, we lost our AD to uh, Texas A&M, and now look uh, at who the Huskers play in the NCAA, men and women. Oh, women too. I didn't know that. I, I mean, I knew that 8-9 game in the men's tournament was Nebraska and Texas A&M, which was just – Funny for me on a lot of fronts. Yes, quite obviously, the fact that Trev Alberts is leaving Nebraska to go to Texas A&M, which I just kind of feel like in all that, I'm like, is anybody winning in that? Like Nebraska fans, I think, felt pretty good about the job Alberts was doing and fundraising and then hiring Matt Rule. So it, it sucks for them. But then I'm looking at it for Texas A&M. I'm like, I, I mean, I guess you can say Matt Rule appears to be promising, but the jury is still very much out on that. Nebraska football is has not been the pillar of what you would want to hang your hat on over the last decade, Texas A&M really only cares about football. Like what I, that just seemed weird all the way around. Nebraska's losing an alum. Now he's going to Texas A&M. I don't whole thing. Very weird to me. Texas A&M fans that I saw on the internet seemed very underwhelmed by it, which frankly I would be too, if I were them, uh, boy, I don't know. I, I, I like watching Nebraska's basketball team though. They're a fun team to watch. 
Um, I watched him kick K State's ass up and down from a courtside seat in Manhattan earlier this year. I think Nebraska is a fun team to watch. So I look forward to that game in the NCAA tournament. David, I would just take solace in the fact that I think you you got a good shot. You got a good shot to win your first NCAA tournament game ever. And then uh, play Houston after that, which that, good luck with that. <laughs> that, all Big 12 fans can um, echo in saying that. Have fun with that. Uh, outside of Iowa State, obviously, <laughs> who just handled them. Anyway, David, appreciate you. Ooh, got that feeling that I'm going to sneeze, guys. I'm sorry. Got some allergies going on here. Jay Rodriguez. What's up, Jay Rodriguez? Uh, Jay Rodriguez, speaking of Houston, says, Hi, John. Congrats to the Cyclones. They broke my heart. I hope my Cougs make a great run in the tourney. Good luck to everyone's team in the chat. Kind words from Jay Rodriguez. The opposite of some smack talk here. I think everybody uh, can appreciate that. Jay Rodriguez, you guys got the regular season crown. You still got a one seed in the tournament, so nothing to uh, to hang your head about. And this is why, you know, I mean, I the committee very clearly seemed to send a message. I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, Jay Rodriguez, that they just don't put very much stock into what happens in the conference tournaments. You know, how, how could you say that you put a lot of stock in that if you're going to make Iowa State the number eight overall seed after they just beat Houston by 28 literally yesterday? Um, that's a that's a tough sell for me. But but I do get why because like the conference tournaments you know kansas held two players out and bill self said afterwards that one of them for sure could have played if it were like a tournament game or a game that they felt like really mattered and these conference tournaments like kind of don't at the high major level unless you're a team that's out of the field and you're trying to go nc state on it and win five games in five days and win the whole thing it just it doesn't really mean that much to everybody else and so I don't know. I mean, that's, I, I guess I can see why they don't put as much stock into that. I know Iowa state fans are really mad and they, they love flexing the big 12 tournament championships. They've got six of them now and it's a cool accomplishment. It's a great thing. I would, I would love to see my team win a big 12 champion uh, tournament championship. Uh, I have seen my team win two big 12 regular season championships, the regular season championship. You're going through 18 games, you got to go play at home. You got to go play on the road. You got to deal with injuries. You got to deal with road crowds, all of those things. Whereas the the tournaments, the conference tournaments, you go in there, it's going to mean more to some teams than others. Some teams aren't going to be putting their all into it like a Kansas in this sort of situation. And Iowa State has just always been a perfect storm where they have not been in the Kansas position, but they're generally pretty good, a team that's dangerous enough. And they go down there with it meaning more to them and being able to bring a ton of fans because it's close enough and the fans really care, which is, again, a huge check mark in the box of like advantage that you bring to the table. But that's it's clearly not as impactful as winning a regular season championship and doing that over the course of 18 games and doing it at home and on the road and dealing with all that and teams putting more into it than they do in the conference tournament. So I guess like long and short of it, I can see why the committee is that way. But we shouldn't ever pretend that they, the committee should not feign or pretend like they really put a lot of stock into what happens there because they clearly don't. There's no way you could if you're going to look at a 28 point win by Iowa State to make them the number eight team uh, in the bracket. So anyway, Jay Rodriguez, great to have you here. Um, and uh, I much appreciate your kind words, as I'm sure everybody does here and uh, i will certainly be rooting for houston national championship good they are absolutely national championship good uh we got grandan grandan uh mr kurtz is coach tang going to louisville no it definitely does not look like that i think if you're concerned about a uh, jerome tang leaving it would be to a, a trickle down job that happens throughout the course of the coaching carousel um louisville seems to be pretty locked in right now on uh Scott Drew, Dusty May, or uh, good old Must Bus. I'm like, why am I blanking on that at uh, at Arkansas? Uh, those seem to be the the real top three right now. Uh, by the way, speaking of Dusty May, how the hell did FAU get an eight seed? I don't. That didn't make any sense to me. Uh, one of the weirder tournament selections there. They got the benefit of seemingly the name from the Final Four run last year. Uh, did not think that that one made a whole lot of sense. But no, there was a, it was one of the Louisville, it was either Rivals 24-7 on three. 
one of those sites listed eight people in front of him, eight candidates in front of him. Um, I just think the stuff for a job like Louisville, the, the, the star isn't bright enough for Tang, even if that comes with, at least I have the understanding that the guy lost a star in Naquan Tomlin who averaged 22 points a game over his last six for Memphis was playing great. I think clearly would have made them a tournament team and lost a potential starting guard. Neither of those played for the entire year dramatically changed the team. And I think he did a hell of a job to get them at least on the bubble and finish eight and 10 in the big 12 with uh, uh, four quad one wins and three quad one a wins. I think that's a pretty impressive accomplishment, but the star faded Louisville's a huge job. They can, they can land a lot of people, but the concern would be like, all right, if Arkansas opens, there's a little bit of scuttlebutt right now about Oklahoma state trying to pursue buzz Williams. If Texas A&M were to open power five job with a lot of money in Texas, you know, I mean, those types of things would start to become more of a concern for me. Um, if there were some trickle down in the coaching carousel uh, based on how that goes, but I don't think Louisville is uh, the concern there anymore. So hope that answers your question. Grand Dan. David, what's up, David? Uh, David says, don't forget with the college football playoff from 2026 and on doesn't require 100% with voting. Uh, the big 12 might have wanted more, but couldn't get enough support. Yeah. We, you don't have to have hundred percent. I don't even, I would think the ACC again was probably fighting harder for this than the big 12, because back to the title of the video, ACC just signed its death warrant. They, they had more to lose in all of this. I would say than the big 12, even if they got, more money and you did just remind me i didn't quite make it through everything in this article so let's go ahead and finish it off here if you have anything else make sure to get it in now it is buzzer beater time click that dollar sign below the chat box to get your thoughts in before we depart here if you could like the video it is totally free i would appreciate that that is um one way to support the channel that is totally free and leave a comment in the comment section of the video. Do you agree with me that the ACC just signed its death warrant by agreeing to this thing? Um, Got to make sure I pick up where I left off here. Uh, major conference schools currently receive about 6 million in distribution from the college football playoff. The SEC and big 10 schools will see their annual distribution triple, if not quadruple into the low 20 million range. ACC and Big 12 schools are set to see more than a doubling of their previous amounts, which again would be right about in line with that 12.5 million that Notre Dame is getting. Independence, UConn, Washington State, and Oregon State will get a small portion. Um, Notre Dame, it points out Notre Dame is also the only major conference school that will not sustain a financial impact of losing multi million dollar payouts from bowl contracts. The SEC, Big 10, Big 12, and ACC all leave behind. Lucrative bowl tie-in contracts uh, with the Rose Orange and Sugar Bowls specifically. So there's another little place where you get nickel and dimed a bit. If you are the Big 12, that's going to matter more to the Big 12 uh, and ACC than it would Big 10 and SEC. Aside from the provision around independence, the performance distribution structure in the past uh, eligible to all teams has been eliminated in this contract. So you're not going to get the money for winning games in there that you would the only performance based incentive is going to be Notre Dame. If they make it, they get that extra 6 million, which will put them in the ballpark, at least getting closer to what the yearly total is for an sec or a big 10 school. Now Dellinger, the wording on this, I, I do feel like is important. Dellinger says the contract was expected to include a definitive look in provision in 2028 where revenue distribution and format can be reevaluated. The look in provision can be triggered earlier by any conference realignment an official format may not arrive until the coming weeks or months. So he's saying the contract was expected to include a definitive look in provision. He's, uh, I would guess that just means he didn't get that detail from whoever he talked to for this latest round of reporting. We expect that to still be in there. And that would be a, a win for the big 12 clearly if it is. And that was something that was pushed by Brett Yormark. We learned from previous reporting, David, I'm going to go ahead and drop this off the screen, but appreciate you, ma'am. Um, just like their heavy revenue share, the SEC and Big Ten are expected to hold significant weight in determining a format starting in 2026. A variety of 14-team formats continue to circulate. One under consideration, and this is the second time now we've seen this mentioned, one under consideration is a 5 plus 9 model that mirrors the current 5 plus 7 12-team format, but features an additional two at-large spots. Uh, there still exists the possibility of multiple automatic qualifiers for individual leagues, 
including a format that grants three to the SEC and Big Ten, uh, two to the ACC and Big 12, and one to the group of five. That's your 3-3-2-2-1 model. I would say it's, it feels like the way this is being reported now, definitely watch out for a five plus nine, which would just be everybody gets their one automatic qualifier, and then you got nine at-large teams. I, you know, To be honest, like I, I like the idea of, hey, the Big 12 gets two automatic bursts, but if we're talking about like what seemingly would make the most sense, it really, to me, would be just you give the conference champ a pass in there. They get in there. Everybody else got to be the at-large. Got to earn it with the at-large. Uh, there is a 2 2 one, one, one plus 7 model under consideration, too. So that would be two ACC, two Big Ten, one Big 12, one uh, ACC, one group of five. It grants, and it goes through all that. Uh, the concept, here's the one last nugget from the story. The concept of the Big Ten and SEC holding exclusive rights over the two first-round buys has received enough pushback that it has been tabled, at least for now. Hopefully that is tabled forever. <laughs> let's let's say tabled forever. I don't think anybody wants to see that, the Big Ten and the SEC getting the exclusive rights over the first two round buys. All right, let's finish the uh, last round of Super Chats here. Robert, what's up, Robert? Uh, Robert says, got to say, worried Tech drew NC State in the first round. Uh, Grant's the man, though. It'll be okay, right? Uh, also, how does Texas get a seven seed? I, You know, I kind of – my head turned a little bit at Texas getting a seven seed, too. Like, I – I don't know, man. That feels like a bit of a more hollow resume than that to me for what Texas was, but whatever. Again, it feels like they don't put a lot of stock into the conference tournaments, which, you know, would not put stock in them losing to uh, to K-State. I will tell you this, Robert, about – now, this is just a very generalized thing. This is not specific to NC State at all. It always feels like the teams that get really hot in the conference tournaments and make a run there then flame out in the NCAA tournament. I can remember like, my God, there was a year like Florida State went crazy in the ACC tournament and they came out as like a two or a three seed. They lost in the first weekend. Feels like that happens a lot. The teams that are like the great story in conference championship weekend are a little bit spent then when they get to the NCAA tournament. I mean, North Carolina State was punching way above its weight class, way out over its skis for that ACC tournament. I would not be very worried. I'm, I'm not, Robert. I'll put it that way. As an outside observer, I'm not worried about Texas Tech in that game. Uh, I am not. So that's me telling you that it'll be okay. That's me telling you it'll be okay. We'll see if that actually helps you sleep at night, Robert. But uh, that that's my word to the wise for you there. But uh, we'll be rooting for Tech for sure. Uh, David. David, does this money go right to the schools or to the conference? Uh, can the conference divide differently? Well, if you wanted to do unequal revenue sharing as a conference, then I, I suppose you could divide that money differently at least i think um i don't know if it's like only tv money i would imagine that any money that comes in you could do unequal revenue sharing for that which has been discussed by some leagues and there is some level of that out there but i don't think for like the big 12 if you're talking about the big 12 i don't think you're going to see that you know we have unequal revenue sharing in the big 10 in terms of what the tv payout is going to be for Oregon and Washington coming into the league, for instance. So we do have some of that going on uh, out there right now. But uh, does it go right to the school? I mean, it's going to go to the conference, who's then going to distribute it evenly to the schools. I don't know, like, the details of, like, what, you know, what bank account that's going in and how that gets dispersed. But it, you're not going to have any of these conferences, at least as of right now, distributing it any differently. Also, remember that we had the SMU deal where SMU was getting not a full payment, but that was – that they weren't going to get that money from the playoff in the first place. So it wasn't like it went to the conference and then went somewhere else. The conference would just get less money, therefore distribute less out to SMU because nobody wanted to give them a full Power 5 payout there. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, and then we get to, uh, we got a buzzer beater from Matthew. What's up, Matthew? Great to hear from you. And Matthew says, buzzer beater from Columbia. Let's go. Um, great to hear from you and great to hear from you abroad. Matthew says, just getting caught up on brackets. We'll be packing my bags for Omaha on Saturday to cheer on the Cougs. No upset, please. Uh, hoping for strong conference results. I'm forgetting actually who BYU is playing. And of course I search on the bracket. It doesn't do anything for me because it's a PDF. BYU's got Duquesne. Okay. Duquesne. 
I don't know. I don't know much about Duquesne, but I did see a graphic that was it over the last 10 years, 11 seeds um, have like a fit. They win like 52% of the time. So just based on the seed, you got to be a little worried there. Um, if you want good news, I just laid out that case about NC state being the team that was red hot during the conference tournament. And then, perhaps stuttering a little bit once they get to the real bracket. Um, Illinois is the three, and Illinois just uh, ran roughshod through the Big Ten tournament. So if you can beat Duquesne, maybe that becomes a, uh, a more winnable endeavor for you. Certainly hope so. I will be rooting for your Cougs for sure, Matthew, and uh, I so much appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to pop in here on the show, especially from Columbia. So hope that uh, you're having a great time, my friend. It is wonderful to hear from you on the show, and thank you for – your support of the channel as always. All right, guys, great stuff tonight. I think that is going to do it for me. But as always, um, if you have something and you are not watching this live, John Dash Kurtz Dash Four on Venmo, you can leave your question or comment there. I will get to it on the next show. Like the video on your way out. That would be amazing. Leave a comment in the comment section of the video underneath. Did the ACC sign its death warrant? Should the ACC have signed off on this thing? with the college football playoff. Let me know what you think. Spread the word about the channel, friends, family, word of mouth, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, threads, X, whatever it might be, whatever social media platform, continue to uh, spread the word. Let's keep growing this audience, uh, which it steadily continues to do so. And I much appreciate all of you guys who do help with that. So glad to be back here tonight after uh, missing the midweek show because of the big 12 tournament. And Hey, Enjoy, uh, enjoy gearing up for the NCAA tournament this week. Looking forward to uh, talking to you on Wednesday, and I will see you guys soon. Take care.